A few weeks ago, um, we attended a birthday party for Lorelei and Grace and Case. And for the party, the Cases uh, rented one of those big inflatable uh, bouncy houses. And Jeremy Case was telling me that he ended up talking to the couple who had dropped off the bouncy house and they explained to him that they were, they were renting it out as a way to raise money for their son who has cerebral palsy. He was scheduled to have an, an operation to ease his, his constant pain from muscle spasms and to help his mobility. But of course, the operation costs more than any uh, person can make in a normal job. And so this couple had been doing everything they could to raise money. So... At any rate, Jeremy talked with this couple for a while. They inflated the bouncy house, and then they left. And then a few hours later, people came, showed up for the party. And after everyone had arrived, Jeremy gathered us all up in his kitchen and told us about this couple who he had just met, raising money for their son's operation, you know, desperate to make their lives, uh, his life just a little bit better. And then Jeremy said... I know this is a strange request at a birthday party, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you can give to help this couple's little boy, would you consider dropping some money in this cup? And then he held up this little red cup and um, put it on the counter. And then he said it again. I know this is a weird request, but I just feel led to do this. And people gave, you know, quite a bit from what I could see, especially since it was kind of a spur of the moment collection. And when the couple came to get the inflatable, the cases were able to bless them with a little more money to put toward their little boy's operation. And I know that that meant a lot to them. And I know that because the couple somehow found out that Megan was at the birthday party, and it turns out that Megan went to high school with them. Now, at first, Megan didn't know who we were collecting the money for, But she later received a message from this former classmate, and it said, when we dropped off that bouncy house at the cases, we immediately knew that they were Christians, that there was something special about them. And after our son recovers from surgery, we would love to come to your church for a service. You know, giving is a powerful act and it's a powerful testimony. It not only helps, it not, it not only helps people uh, 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 provide for a need, but it can be so lo- uplifting because it says to the recipient, we see you. Someone cares about your plight, about your little boy suffering, and you are not alone. Now today, I want to talk to you about giving. And you probably know that as Christians, we are instructed to give generously but we don't always do that at least not all of us and there's a lot of reasons for for why we don't but i think it often boils down to two things either just being too self-focused or fear and i've told you all before that i've been guilty of not giving enough because i was afraid the fear of not having enough is very real for some of us But that's not how God wants us to live. We know that. In fact, I think deep down, every Christ follower wants to be a generous giver. Nobody wants to be a miserly Scrooge. After all, the word miser and miserable come from the same root. We don't like to be generous givers, but many times we just fall short. At least I do. You see, since we live in a material world, it's tempting to be preoccupied by material needs and possessions. It's tempting to focus only on the here and now. And it's so easy to convince ourselves that the money we make belongs to us, not God. It it represents our time and energy. And we can come to believe that it's our only hope and security for the future. We want to be generous givers, but we really have to battle our worldly nature in order to do that. And that means we have to constantly remind ourselves of a few biblical truths. And the first truth is that money and possessions often stimulate evil desires and even evil behaviors. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 6 says, A fortune made by a lying tongue 
is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. But you know, people lie on their resumes frequently, even Christians, pad their expense accounts, fudge the numbers on their income tax returns, overcharge their clients. Why? Because they want more money and they'll violate God's laws to get it. And it seems to me that now more than ever, we live in this world where everyone is playing a game called, how much money can I squeeze out of my neighbor? And they justify it by reasoning, well, that's just business. It's just business. But you know that phrase, it's just business? It's being used to justify all sorts of immoral and unethical practices. You know, you overcharge your customer, that's just business. Take advantage of someone, that's just business. Charge the maximum, provide the minimum, that's just business. I know of someone who left his job working for an HVAC company because his boss pressured him to tell customers that their heating and air unit had to be totally replaced when in fact it could be repaired. That way they could make a bigger sale. And that's just business is what he was told over and over again. But that's no way to live. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 19 says, Better, be, better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share the plunder with the proud. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 6 says, Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. Now, second, money and possessions can increase anxiety. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12 says that the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. The abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Pastor John Ortberg, in his book, The Life You Always Wanted, tells about the time that he and his wife bought their first piece of new furniture. It was a mauve sofa. Now, for all you men, this is what a mauve sofa looks like. You probably thought that was light pink or maybe light tan, but that's mauve. Now, John Ortberg Uh, wrote this. He said, the man at the furniture store warned us not to get it when he found out that we had small children. He said, you don't want a mauve sofa. You need something the color of dirt. (laughs) But we said, well, we know how to handle our children, so give us the mauve sofa. And from that moment on, we all knew clearly the number one rule in our house. Don't sit on the mauve sofa. Don't touch the mauve sofa. Don't play around the mauve sofa. Don't eat on, breathe on, look at, or think about the mauve sofa. He said, it was kind of like the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. On every other chair in the house, you may sit freely. But upon this sofa, this mauve sofa, you shall not sit. For in the day you sit thereon, you shall surely die. Well, He said to uh, his wife's horror, they discovered just days after getting this moth sofa that there was a red jelly stain on it. So she lined up the, the three children and she asked them for a confession. And John Ortberg said, there was silence for the longest time. No one said a word. I knew the children wouldn't confess, he said, because they'd never seen their mother so upset. And I knew they wouldn't confess because... They knew that if they did, they would sit for eternity on the timeout chair. And I knew they wouldn't confess because I was the one who put the red jelly stain on the moth sofa. And I wasn't saying anything. (laughs) And we laugh at that. And I think it's because we see the truth in it. Often, the more things we get, the more stress that they can cause. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where it will last forever. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And what Jesus is telling us is that our bank statement can reveal our spiritual condition lots of times. So, Does yours show a reckless spender, a miserly hoarder, 
or a generous giver. In the third century, there was a man named Cyprian, who was the bishop of an ancient uh, city called Carthage. And here's how he described wealthy people way back then in his time. He said, their property held them in chains, chains which shackled their courage and choked their faith and hampered their judgment and throttled their souls. They think of themselves as owners, whereas it is they rather who are owned. Enslaved as they are to their own property, they are not the masters of their money, but its slaves. And I think those ancient words still ring true today. You know, years ago, I visited a World War II concentration camp and just walking around a place where human beings were exterminated by the hundreds is so sobering and it makes you think. And there are countless stories about how Jews heading to these camps would lug around these big suitcases filled with their most valuable possessions, gold, silver, jewelry, family heirlooms, but it was pointless. In the end, it was all going to go to the enemy. There was a cruel saying among the German camp guards that the only escape is through the smoke of the chimney. But you know, I see some similarities in the people of our time. You know, lugging around uh, money and possessions, which can become kind of a burden lots of times, thinking they'll bring happiness and security. But in the end, they're going to be left behind. They're going to go right back to the world. And so maybe, maybe we'd be better to give a little more away especially to people in need. And I guess if I had to sum up today's message, I would say this. According to God, giving is a wise investment. According to God, giving is a very wise investment. It's wiser than investing in stocks or bonds or real estate. Giving generously is a very tangible way to show that you trust God, to show that he is sitting on the throne of your life. And Jesus promised in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, given it will be given to you, a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. But of course, you know, we shouldn't get, caught, get too caught up in the rewards of giving. We should be giving with a pure heart to help others, not to get rewards. Charles Dickens once said, do all the good you can and make as little fuss about it as possible. Now today, we continue in our sermon series to the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're up to chapter 8. And before I read this uh, section of scripture, I want to explain a little bit of what's going on. So you probably know by now that the book of 2 Corinthians is really a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in a big ancient city called Corinth. The Corinthians were from Corinth. And in this section of his letter, Paul talks about the Jerusalem church, which is really struggling at this time. Um, times were just very tough because persecution at this church had left many uh, Christians in Jerusalem jobless and homeless. In fact, the Christians there were uh, forced to scatter because the persecution had gotten so bad. And so they were in great need to the point that they were hungry. And so in this letter, Paul is about to ask the, the Corinthian church to help out. And we'll learn uh, that they had already pledged to help at some point, and now Paul is asking them to follow through on that pledge. But before he does that, Paul seems to use a healthy dose of guilt to kind of motivate this Corinthian church. And the way he does this is by telling this church that other churches in Macedonia, which were very poor, did everything that they could to help. In fact, these other churches were begging to help. Okay, so we're going to read this together. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting with verse 1. It says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. 
For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift um, for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know, the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. And he's talking spiritually uh, rich. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing so. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make your life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those in, who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. Now, there are so many things that we could learn from these passages, and I think one of the most important comes from the example of the, uh, the churches in Macedonia. Paul says that they were very, very poor, and yet they gave beyond what they could afford. And, you know, sometimes, I think in America, uh, people who are poor, they can sometimes become resentful and stingy. They feel no obligation to give anything ever. And unfortunately, I think our government often feeds this victim mentality, telling the poor that they are helpless and should never give a dime. But these Macedonians responded to the need of the poor in Jerusalem and they were very poor themselves, but yet they gave generously. And, I, and you know what that means? Well, I think it means that everyone can give something. Everyone can give something. A family living paycheck to paycheck can give a little. A high school student working minimum wage can give a little. But the truth is, the vast majority of us in this room are not poor, and so we should give more. If you have an average income in the United States, you are in the upper 5 to 10% in the economy of the world. So you are rich. And Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, to command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I read this week about a rich American um, who was a businessman, and he was with his lawyer, and they were traveling through Korea. And they saw this little boy pulling a plow as his father was guiding the handles. And the businessman said, that must be a really poor family. And the lawyer answered, yes, that's the Choi Ni family. They're Christians, and their church is raising money to build a sanctuary. And they sold their ox and gave the proceeds to the church, and now the little boy pulls the plow. And it was then that the businessman realized that he had never really given anything that was truly a sacrifice. He only gave out of his abundance, never during times of scarcity. He never did excel in the act of giving. And the question is, do we? You know, this is one of those Sundays when God's timing is clearly perfect. You see, a few weeks ago, Paul Loy, who's one of our elders over missions, suggested that we take up a special offering to give to the poor. And I agreed to that, not knowing that I would be preaching on giving to the poor. 
And um, because you all know, anyone who knows me knows I'm not a planner. I don't plan that far ahead. And so when I looked to see what the next section was in 2 Corinthians, I thought, Lord, you could not have planned this better. I'm preaching on giving to the poor on the very Sunday that we are asking the church to give to the poor. Now, today's collection is for the people of Sierra Leone, which is a West African country known for its corrupt diamond mining And um, this corruption fueled wars across their nation for over a decade throughout the 1990s. And Hollywood actually made a a movie about uh, these wars called Blood Diamond. Um, The war left thousands of people impoverished, uh, many uh, uh, amputees. The average life expectancy for a Sierra Leonean is only 56. Um, And what makes matters worse is that Sierra Leone has this rainy season, and that runs for about a third of their year. And by the time the rains arrive, many of these poor households, um, they're already running low on food, and it's going to be quite some time until the next crop will be ready. And so they call this the lean season. And so the lean season comes every single year for these people, and um, they're always challenged to get through it. Now, what would you do? What would you do if you were a father or a mother of children and you have to endure through this uh, long, lean season um, every single year? What would you do if your kids are hungry? Well, you would do whatever you could to feed them. And so many of these families, they take out these high interest loans to buy whatever food they can. I read that a 100% interest rate is not uncommon. And so what happens is these families, they get trapped in this cycle of debt and poverty, and children are the ones who suffer the most. Now, just a few weeks ago, Samuel and Rachel Pyle joined our church family, and I'm so glad that they did. This young couple are great examples of what we should strive to be when it comes to giving and to making a difference. You see, Samuel is from Sierra Leone. His father was murdered in the war there, and his mother died because of the poverty and just the poor medical care. And so Samuel grew up in in an orphanage, and um, through this kind of crazy chain of events, but yet God orchestrated chain of events, he ended up getting adopted when he was 17 years old which is absolutely unheard of there. So he moved to the United States, went to Hanover College where he met Rachel, and they started a nonprofit mission organization to spread the gospel in Sierra Leone and to help care for the poor there. And part of that mission is buying bags of rice. And for $40, you can buy a bag big enough to feed a family of five for an entire month to get them through this rainy season. And... um, We've got a a very short video of Samuel sharing a little bit more about uh, the mission there. Hello, friends of LBMF. I want to take this time to say thank you very much for being a partner with us this past five years of raising funds for rice donation. It's been five years since we have been helping families in need in Sierra Leone during the rainy season. This is the time of the year when we do our fundraising and those that have been part of this, helping us make a difference, I want to take this time to say thank you. And those that want to partner with us to continue making a difference in Sierra Leone by helping a family of five with a bag of rice during the rainy season in Sierra Leone. I am super excited to continue helping people in need. And I hope that wherever you are, you can partner with us so that we all can continue to make a difference. With just $40, you can help a family during the rainy. Yeah, that was actually the end of the video. It's just rainy season, and then that was the end. Um, um, and, and Samuel was just telling me before the service that he is actually going to Sierra Leone this month. And so whatever is collected will be um, hand-delivered by him. And so I think that's one of the great things about uh, this offering as well. Um, now, today, God led us to a portion of Scripture 
<clears throat> that talks about giving to those in need. That was no accident because today God knew that we would be asked to give toward bags of rice to help hungry kids and to help these families escape this cycle of poverty. So um, we're going to go ahead and have Samuel and Rachel. They might already be out. In, oh, there they are. Um, we're going to go ahead and have them um, go out into the foyer and someone maybe help them uh, find an offering plate. And if you would like to give toward that offering, you can just drop it in their plate on the way out the door. Um, and whether you can give, to not, give or not, um, please pray for this couple. They have taken on a really, a really big mission. And so um, they, need, they need prayer. Okay. Um, let's pray. Oh, I think that you can still make the check to Charleston Independent Church if you want it to uh, be reflected in your giving. You can do that, and then Jane will probably just write them one big check. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm completely wrong. It needs to be made out to looking back, moving forward. Looking back, moving forward. And that's on a slide. I don't know if we can put that slide back up, the very first one. Looking back, moving forward. Let's pray. Father, without a doubt, the gift of Jesus, he is the most costly gift you've ever given. And your son, who owned the entire universe, came to earth to be born in a lowly stable. He was raised by peasant parents. And your word says that he made himself nothing and died on a cross as a sacrifice for our sins that, so that we could be rich in forgiveness. You know, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And Father, we know that Jesus died so that we could be rich in hope. What does it profit, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And so, Lord, I pray for anyone here who has not given their life to Jesus Christ because one day, not too far from now, they're going to die and leave all their worldly possessions behind. Money and things won't matter, but only their relationship with Jesus. So I pray for unbelievers, that they would accept your gospel this morning and come to you. And I pray for Christians that we would live with eternity in mind and be generous givers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.